Art is continually being considered important nowadays. How much of this is to do with the huge economic value? Well, I think what's really making it most such a mess of things are these uh, hedge fund buyers, collectors, because sort of nearly all the collectors are sort of these, these sort of 35-year-old billionaires who have no eye, and all they want is something which they see as an investment, um, uh, I think probably wrongly, uh, that these things that maybe some of them have made a great deal of money. I mean, they're paying five million and, and ending up with something worth 50 million. But I think on the whole, they have no idea what they're buying. They want something that screams Picasso or, or, or Andy Warhol from the wall and uh, that is very colorful, takes up a lot of space. Um, if it's erotic, so much the better. I mean, then people will look and, and, and they'll, they'll think the owner is, 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 is quite a guy. And, um, uh, and this has had the most appalling effect, it seems to me, on the art market. Because um, the result is that everything's got too big. And, uh, and let's face it, American apartments on the whole are not, don't have very high ceilings. And um, they always look rather squashed. And or they're all kept in, they now buy these installation pieces, but they're all kept in, in garages or in storerooms. And um, I don't know, today at the, I got rather depressed in the end looking around all this stuff. It didn't seem to, um, it, one needed some, uh, some of the predecessors to, to give the, these new works validity. And uh, they desperately needed to be validated, I thought. Let's talk about creativity. You knew Picasso, of course. Uh, tell me about him. Well, I think Picasso was so exceptional in that he, 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 he lived the life of an artist. I mean, and he, his life was, even when he was 80 on into his 90s, his life was very much that of an artist. I mean, when you went to see Matisse, I mean, it was like going to see a very distinguished old professor who um, talked um, very, very beautifully and uh, intelligently uh, uh, about a certain subject. I mean, he was very eloquent. Whereas with Picasso, I mean, it was fireworks going off right and left. And, uh, and paradoxically, he liked to, uh, he'd say something and then five minutes later, he'd say the opposite. So you were always sort of, you know, you kept on your, your uh, you kept, uh, um, uh, you, 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 you remained alert. I mean, Dora Maher told me once that because I said to her one morning, uh, I, love, I love that painting. My God, you're painting well. It's a wonderful painting. It's, it's, it's as good as a Cezanne. She was thrilled to bits the rest of the day. She's purring away to herself. Pablo thinks I'm as good as Cezanne. And that evening over dinner, apropos nothing at all, because I suddenly said, I think Cezanne's full of shit, don't you? And um, this is, uh, I mean, this is so unlike most other, other I mean, you, you, he sort of got you into, into his life in some way, and, and um, you, were, you were sort of part of this crazy ride. How did Picasso view you, um, the beautiful Englishman who actually understood his art? <laughs> he understood, he got, Picasso was a, uh, Picasso was a sort of Dracula-like figure in certain ways. He had to get your energy, your love, your energy. If he, could, if he could extract it from you, he would. And he usually was successful at this. And um, I'd been to, the, to see him a few times, but when Douglas and I moved to Provence, and at the, roughly the same time that Picasso had bought the California, the great big villa. So we used to see him all the time and go over there and he'd come over to us for bullfights. And I remember the first time I'd, he'd settled in and we, he was showing a whole lot of his recent drawings, great big ink wash drawings. And he always used to say, lequel est le plus fort, which is the strongest, not which is the most beautiful. So Douglas said that one and I said that one. And, um, and then three months later, we went back two months later. 
we went back and Picasso said, oh, by the way, I remembered that, that drawing you liked so much when you were last here. I've got it out of the portfolio and I've put it up. Let's look at it again. Here was I, whatever I was, I mean, 20, early 20s, never thought that I'd ever meet Picasso, let alone that he'd ask what I felt about one of his drawings. And inevitably, um, tears welled up in my eyes and uh, choked out some uh, remark. And then the second uh, time I went to the studio, the, uh, it's more or less the same thing happened. And then the third time I said, Pablo, what's going on? He said, you were the only person. There's only one other person I could make cry like that. And uh, he got one. And that was the, the stroke that he used for this bloke. And, um, uh, and then, you know, once he'd, he'd established this, you were in like Flynn. But didn't you find yourself resenting it, though? Not in the least. No, like I loved him, and 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 um, and he was so. I mean, he he just uh, flashed those blazing, enormous eyes at you, you know, and and uh, I, I would melt. I mean, and and um, and he also was very physical with people. I mean, men, women, children, dogs, old, young. I mean, didn't matter. And huge, huge hugs. And then always this sort of physical thing, you know, sort of stroking the side of anybody's face. I mean, uh, and uh, so you had this sort of, um, sort of physical contact with him, um, which, which uh, uh, was so important in my case, with, in my, um, my feeling of, of, um, of understanding of his work and, and of him and closeness to him. Your books on Picasso are extremely famous because of the direct experience you had of him. How do you react to the more academic writings about him? Everything I wrote about Picasso was really inspired by personal experience, by closeness to him, understanding of him. I just, a lot of these, these matters I discussed. I used to come over to Castille. We'd look at his Cubist paintings and drawings, and, and as well as Braque's and uh, Juan Gris and so on. So. I sort of got into his, into his mindset in a way. And I don't know whether I was academic or, or non-academic, but it seemed to me that uh, Picasso was constantly saying that uh, his work was his diary. And I was going to take him up on that. And I think that's what I did. Really, soon after I came to live in America, it was the sort of Ross Krauss um, approach to art history, this extremely... Um, uh, anti-biographical approach that was in fashion and she sort of forced this uh, uh, her own views onto the world and so much of what was written either was incomprehensible or that it simply didn't relate to the work which was being discussed because they didn't know they'd get the date wrong the the subject wrong the characters it, the, the identification of the characters wrong I mean it might just have been uh, they might just as well have been writing about a completely, or, or talking about a completely different painting. It was so, uh, uh, it had seemed to me so often it had nothing to do with what the painting represented, nothing to do with the image. And even the image was somehow uh, unimportant in, to so much of these people. What was really important was their ideas, and one felt that so much of the writing was, uh, in so much of the writing, they were, it was this kind of, a narcissist looking in a mirror and admiring the beauty of his ideas and or his or her ideas and um, the brilliance of them and to hell with the work of art to hell with the subject of, of all this now there's a Picasso on the wall behind you and it's dedicated to you can you tell me some more about that one um, uh, it stay, it, it's um, uh, uh, I will remember very well it was before Christmas and Douglas and I had gone over to, it must be, I think it's 59, something like that. I can't remember the date. Uh, but Douglas and I had gone over to get them Christmas presents. And Picasso said, here's this row of drawings I've just done. Take a look at them. And which one do you think is, again, lequel est le plus fort? And I chose that one. And um, Douglas, characteristically, uh, chose one which... Uh, a lot was going on in it, rather too much, and it had been overworked, but it looked ex the more expensive, and this was the more sort of um, uh, simple and, and, and straightforward. And um, 
Douglas said, there's your Christmas presents. At this moment, American dealer and his wife uh, uh, have a, they've had a date with him, and they, they'd come in. And it was the man, oh, God, I can't remember his name, who uh, gave, uh, gave Picasso a big American car in exchange for a painting. Um, anyway, I'll think of that later. Uh, so this American couple comes in, and... Uh, Picasso, who tended to loathe most dealers. I mean, he uh, he suffered so much from from mean-spirited dealers when he was young, and so he, he if he could sort of do a tease on dealers, uh, he used to do that very often on the beach. I mean, he'd do an enormously elaborate drawing in the sand, and he'd watch the expression on their faces as the sea washed it all out. And in this case, uh, he said to the wife of the of of, um, of the dealer, uh, I think that the one Douglas has chosen needs a bit more work on it, don't you? And so he sat down, and he got sort of colours, and he put all the colours in the world on, uh, on this on this drawing, and you could see the dealer thinking, God, now it's worth five hundred thousand dollars, now it's worth six hundred thousand. My God, if he put some blue on, it's going to be worth even more, and um, uh, and. Douglas was getting desperate because they were because it was systematically ruining his drawing, and um, finally, uh, the wife of the dealer went. She pointed at the watch, and said, "I don't want to, to get going because she had a hairdresser's appointment," and because who wanted to get rid of the men away said, uh, "I wouldn't dream of holding you up." Of course, your hairdresser's a point, the most important thing of your life, I know. And so do, do um, get going, because it wouldn't do to be late, would it? And I'm so sorry. I mean, we've been so busy talking, and I'm so busy working on this thing that I haven't had time to look anything out for you. And off they went. Yes. <laughs> and you ended up with that. that and I ended up with yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. You choose to live in English country house style. Why is that? I mean, it just came about that way. I mean, I didn't choose anything particularly. I just had a lot of junk and, and um, uh, didn't have, when I bought this place, I didn't have any big furniture. So a lot of stuff is uh, um, caterers' tables, you know, with, with cloths thrown over them. And it's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. And, um, and I had some pictures and, uh, and some bit of family furniture and stuff. And I suppose it's the usual English melange. And... Um, uh, if it looks country house, like, all the better. I mean, I, 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 that's what I, I suppose I unconsciously liked. You've been painted by Lucien Freud. How did that come about? Well, Lucien and I have known each other since um, he was 18 and I was 16 and a half or something. I mean, ever since I was at art school. And I met him then. And we became friends. Uh, but, um, and he wanted to draw me and uh, do a drawing, which I desperately wanted him to do. But then Douglas Cooper came into my life, and Douglas and Lucien did not get on at all well. So Douglas did everything to sort of um, uh, sabotage this, this idea. And then, God knows, 50 years later, uh, and Lucien and I had a, a very close sort of telephonic friendship in that when Lucien works... Uh, it's like sort of going to a doctor. I mean, you 8 to 12 in the morning, uh, in the afternoon there's a session, and then there's an evening session. And then in order to unwind, he likes to um, uh, call somebody up and, and, and just talk. But in London, I mean, everybody's either asleep or out or screwing away or something. And I was here, and for me it was 7 o'clock in the evening, midnight in London, and so Lucien got in the habit two or three times a week of calling me, and he'd unwind. And it would always end up being a walk down memory lane, and, and because we had so, so many friends in the past. Do you, what's ever happened to so-and-so? Um, there was a woman we knew called Sodomy Johnson. And whatever happened to old Sod? And um, he had all kinds of stories. I had all kinds of stories. And this was... Uh, and he talked to me about his work. And... I would love to have put a tap on the telephone because, I mean, he was completely relaxed and talking about his painting, talking about his life. But obviously I never would, I mean, without telling him, in which case the, this wonderful flow would have dried up. 
And uh, so once when I went over for nine days, Lucien said, look, I've got, you've got nine days. Uh, you can either have a small painting or a drawing. I said, a small painting, and he did that. And uh, there was a, a size bigger, which was uh, he ultimately used for the Queen, because if he could do me this size on, in nine days, he thought he could do the Queen a little bit bigger in, in three months or whatever it was with, with some extra uh, sittings, which indeed he, he did. And it was it, the, the one of the Queen was the next one really after after the one of me, and um, the, I've got that wonderful photograph there of, of of Lucian the Queen and the the uh, a portrait on the easel looking absolutely exactly like the Queen. I mean the face is the same size and everything. So uh, uh, then um, sitting for Lucian was uh, sheer pleasure um, because Lucian has a fantastic memory for, uh, for poetry of all kinds. I mean, he, he, he can recite the whole of... Um, there's a wonderful Kipling poem about a, uh, a, a mean-spirited old um, ship owner. Uh, the rare, I can't remember what it's called. And he knows most of that by heart. He knows Keats by heart. He knows uh, equally uh, popular songs by heart. I mean, he, 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 um, he's got this incredible memory. So he'd start humming a song or something, or he'd, he'd re remember quotes from Shakespeare or from um, whoever it was. So that is, that is uh, enormously diverting. Uh, and then uh, Lucien wants to get, uh, like I think like all port portraitists do, sort of get, get as close as he can to your... Uh, to what you're all about. And uh, so, I mean, with long conversations, and then, shh, don't move, you know, keep your mouth shut for a bit. And, um, uh, and just uh, this, the last brush stroke was put on as the cab came to take me to, to Heathrow. And it was nine, and then he said, I'm going to be able to do the Queen now. And what we're all waiting for now is, how is volume four? Is it coming along? I haven't begun it because although volume three sold very well, I mean 50,000 copies in America, um, I haven't received one single cent. And uh, I don't know what's happened. My agent, uh, I mean, I keep on saying, some royalties, please. Oh, well, we won't get those. You, you, uh, volume two didn't sell all that well. I don't know what the excuses are. And um, so... Uh, I don't know whether Volume 4 is ever going to be done. What I would like to do is to record as much as I can uh, because uh, towards the end of it, it's the period which I knew and I, I, I've got a lot of information uh, which, I think, which, which I think is fairly valuable. But who knows? I mean, I was 84 two weeks ago and we'll see. <laughs> Thank you.